sent you were the best in the Parsec. Welcome to Parsec Passion, a podcast about Disney Plus's The Mandalorian, the first live action Star Wars show. My name's Bubba, and with me as always is someone with the lowest M count. It's Catfish. Catfish, how you doing? Oh, lowest M count. Oh my God. I'm doing great, Bubba. I am so excited to talk about this episode of The Mandalorian. Oh my God. I'm... I'm quivering with excitement. (laughs) Okay, put on a shawl, get warm. We're going to cover everything, listeners. And so, heck, let's get to it right here at the top, Catfish. We are now at the halfway point. This is Season 2, Episode 4. There are only four more episodes left. We have seen all the footage from the trailer. So for these last four episodes, it will completely be brand new. We just saw Season 2, Episode 4 again, Chapter 12, entitled The Siege. What is your rating out of 10 for this episode? Well, Bubba, as you can probably tell from my excitement, I'm going to do something that I I don't even, uh, out of the probably maybe 200 podcasts we've done, I don't know, I may have, be, have done this two or three times. Bubba? Yeah? I am giving this episode 10, what I like to call triple S's. Triple S's? Yes, that is, as we all know, you know, sometimes when you watch a movie and you see like it's in the Middle Ages and they have this amazing armor on Mm -hmm. and it's like they have to fight in a very delicate manner so that they don't (laughs) ruin the surprise about how weak the armor is. Well, they don't need to do that here because apparently there is substandard stormtrooper shielding is a real thing. In other words, (laughs) this this stormtrooper uniforms are less hardy in the real world than they actually look on screen one shot uh, <laughs> apparently there's something it's almost like the death star if you hit it you know if you hit the death star in the right place it exact blows up. right place yeah you know what the right place is on a um, stormtrooper uniform Wait, anywhere yeah everywhere anywhere <laughs> <laughs> anywhere <laughs> one shot i mean these guys you know it's these poor stormtroopers you, you know the death troopers i i presume they're saving all their power for the death troopers okay <laughs> Jokes aside, yeah. Jokes aside, okay. The excitement. This was a thrilling episode. The humor of it was great. Oh my god, just just funny stuff. Not like the stuff that they try to do with what's her name, um, Amy Sedaris. Amy Sedaris. It's actually really funny off top, tying into the larger story about what's going on with Twoda. It was. Thrilling. I was worried at some point. He's like, oh, my God, Twoda, when they realized that this isn't what they think it is and people are looking for Twoda, this is dangerous here. He goes back. I was worried, oh, my God, is he going to – are we going to spend some time looking for Twoda again? No. Mm-hmm. He comes back right away with Twoda. The stuff with Twoda tonight was hilarious. I mean, we have to save things for our adorable moment. But Twoda, the little child on a Disney ride with his hands up in the air. Oh, yes. After having eaten a turkey leg and a bunch of candy, we all know what (laughs) happens. This was my favorite episode of The Mandalorian. Even with the setup, you know, we had the same thing. Oh, side quest, which is ridiculous. Ties into the main story. I can't possibly go over 10, and that's what I gave it. 10. What about you, Bubba? Well, Catfish, our listeners know that you and I have been disagreeing a bit. I mean, slightly. We disagree a bit. And so I think this will really shock the listeners after listening to you. Because I'm going to give this nine, what I like to call, double G's out of ten. Oh, double G's? Yeah, double G is grief grief. And what I... <laughs> Okay, and what I mean by that is uh-huh. this poor mithril, we don't even know its name. We just know its species is a mithril, uh, Horatio Sands in the blue makeup. Yes, he was cooking the books. He stole some money. But Apollo Creed, grief himself, grief carga, grief gives grief. It should be a, a triple G. Mm-hmm. Grief gives grief because, like, they get to the point, and I'm going to go through it when we recap the episode, but they get to the point where they have to turn off the coolant so the reactor will blow, so the lava will blow up. And all four of them are there. The controls to turn it off are on this dangerous, tiny walkway where you could fall to your death. 
And grief is like, okay, go turn that off. And the mithril asks a great question. Well, why don't you do it? And grief himself says, we'll watch the door. What, all three of you? <laughs> I mean, what, <laughs> what the well, hell? Not only that, but up to that point, every time they, they had the mithril do something and he didn't want to do it, Grief was like knocking a years off his sentence. No offer here. Just do it. Stand <laughs> right. over the lava, and I'm not even going to give you an extra year off your 350-year sentence. Right. And Grief, why doesn't he do it? I mean, why doesn't anybody else do it? Mando has a jetpack, so if he falls, he could, you know, you know, shoot himself back up. But Grief was given Grief. It was ridiculous, but like you, Catfish, I was very tempted to go 10 out of 10, but I decided to go 9 out of 10. Why uh-huh. is that Why? I can retroactively make this episode a 10 out of 10 if they use that possible cloning technology to bring back the client, Werner Herzog. <laughs> if they use that, Obviously, then this episode will retroactively become a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very high on it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, at this point, that's the most important reason to do the cloning technology, to bring back the client. You know, it's funny. You talk about Grief Karga, a.k.a. Mm-hmm. Apollo Creed. Yep. Now, he directed this episode. He did. Catfish, so last week yep. we had this debate on who was the best director of them all. You picked Apollo Creed. <laughs> you picked Carl Weathers. This is hilarious. He <laughs> knocked it out of the park. He did. And of course, you know, I realize now that's what we have to call him now is not Grief Karga or Apollo Creed. We need to call him Apollo Lead because he leaded this episode. You he, get it? You see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, listeners, we are giddy with excitement. I'll say that who cares what we think? We want to know what you think. Write to us on our social media platforms at Double PHQ. That's the word double, the single letter P, and then the letters HQ for headquarters, at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, facebook.com slash Double PHQ. YouTube, leave those comments. We want to hear from you. We've heard from some of you already, and we know some of you guys aren't as high on this as we are. And the word that you mentioned last week, Catfish, is getting to some of our listeners, and that is the side quest, the side quest, the side quest. In season one, he did a lot of things but he didn't kind of have an overriding goal. Okay, he needed a job, he needed money, so he helped get involved with the prison break. But that didn't seem to be taking away from some other mission he had. This year, he has a mission to return the child to its people, to the Jedi, to whomever. So every adventure doesn't feel like, ooh, this is an adventure of the week. This is feeling for people that this is a side quest, and for some people, even this episode, rough for them. So we're going to read their feedback in a bit. All right. Just as a preamble to my own double P. Double P? Yeah, pushback preamble. Oh, okay. um, Is that both in this last episode and in this one, the side quest opened up part of what's going on in the larger world of the Mandalorian. Yep. While he's still doing his thing, the entire larger world is coming into focus, which is amazing. Amazing to me. I agree. I was really giddy watching this. And even some of what I would say grief's corniness. Grief has a bit of corniness in him. But last year when baby Twoda was trying to save him from that injury he got and he yells out, oh, he's trying to eat me. Or his classic, do the magic hand thing, baby. I loved that. And even this, I I was just giddy the whole time. And when we got to some of those scenes or some of those reveals, which open up the larger world, yeah, I wanted to go 10 out of 10. I'm going to hold off, but listeners... I knew you wouldn't. I'm not sure if you've ever done it in your life, Bubba. So for me, a 9 out of 10 from you is pretty much a 10 out of 10. Okay. Just like a 7 from Matt is like a (laughs) 2. Listeners, we've got some of your great feedback. I know we've gotten some from at Harley Camille, at Endless Mike 03, Stephanie Culver, at Culverst. We've got it from V. Mosinino, Ho, Michael Carlson, Shakes of Thrones, Dooley's Left Legs, Nathan Savka, <laughs> Edgar Danger, Pat Man 23, Laura McMillan, Tammy Reeves, Stephen Madzik. I think I've lost some. We've been getting so much feedback in. So if I just want you to say that one name again. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that Twitter handle? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's V Mozino. Yeah, about- there you go. I think that's better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think it might be V Moisino. Uh, yes, I think it go. is. But I knew you were giggling about that because I tried to go through <laughs> it so quick. 
<laughs> Not quick enough because you split it up into like three different words. <laughs> We'll be going over your feedback a little later in the podcast. We'll also be having our quadruple M's. Quadruple M's? Yes. It's Matt Murdock's musical Makedown. <laughs> motifs? Right. <laughs> Sorry. That's what I meant. Matt Murdock's musical motifs, where he breaks down the music, and uh, listeners love that as well. Want to continue and mention our contest. I read a lot of feedback we've got from listeners. Listeners, we are almost at the point. In fact, we may have just hit the point where we don't have a prize for every single person who <laughs> sent in the proof that they're what? a subscriber. No. But, but listeners, don't let that stop you. We are giving I'm away. I'm going to pitch in some Bubba I still have from years ago when you and I went to, I don't know how they were able to do it, but there was a pop-up scum and villainy oh, right. uh, bar that happened here in, in Los Angeles. Yep. And we got some amazing beer glasses and some tokens from it. I'm going to pitch those in. I want everybody to get something. Listeners, the way you can be eligible to win some of these great prizes, including our grand prize, this awesome 10-inch, beautiful Funko Pop figure, which is Mando and the Child, a.k.a. Baby Yoda, a.k.a. Tween Yoda, Twoda, is you send us a screen grab of proof that you subscribe to this, whether you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, however you subscribe, Podbean, send it to us, and you'll be eligible to win. So please do it. We're trying to give a prize to everybody, and we have so much stuff to give away that we love hearing from you guys. Also, just this week, we had a special bonus podcast, so check in your feed to find it. We had a bonus podcast where Catfish and I broke down the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special, Ooh, which mm, was mm. fun, but nowhere close to the fun of this episode we just watched, Chapter 12 of the Siege. But you'll find that in your podcast feed. Also, our good buddy Double M Matt Murdock and our good, wonderful pal Double H Holly Hunt Pants, they are breaking down the BBC HBO show, His Dark Materials. It's on a podcast entitled The Dust Podcast. Search for that wherever you download podcasts. It started up this week. It is in season two, so it's covering some of the stuff from my favorite book in that series, The Subtle Knife, and they're doing a great job. So look on your podcast apps for The Dust Podcast. Double M and Double H, they do a great job. Oh my God, they do do a great job. Bubba, there is so much Star Wars material out oh, yeah. there these days. I don't know if you are aware of this, Bubba, but I finally picked up a uh, Oculus Quest because they came up with the Oculus Quest 2. Yeah. And oh, and they have uh, when I when I picked it up, they had one Star Wars game on there that's called Vader Immortal that's in three parts, which I haven't gotten to yet. And just this week they opened up we got another one called Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, yep. which apparently I'll get to hang out around the corner from Star Wars Land in <laughs> Disney. <laughs> They're killing it right now. They are killing it right now. Going forward, we still don't know when that next movie, which should be directed by Taika Waititi, is going to come out. Because of this pandemic we're all suffering through here in 2020, that got pushed back and pushed back. But one thing we know from promos for Disney Plus that have run across the world, Mando Season 3 will be next year in 2021. These promos mention all the great things coming to Disney Plus next year in 2021, and they don't mention the upcoming Obi-Wan miniseries that'll be on Disney Plus, nor the Rogue One Cassian Andor series. So you would imagine both of those Disney Plus shows will debut actually in 2022, which might mean we might have three Star Wars shows coming out in 2022. Mando Season 4, it would be. Obi-Wan and Cassie Nandor. Yeah, this Disney's making well, money, buddy. You know, it is tough to shoot right now because of COVID. The unions, SAG and IATSE, have come up with what you need to do, and it makes things harder to shoot. I just wonder... Uh, you know, two things. Okay. Um, one, you know, there's been all this talk and it's scuttlebutt. And it, 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 even someone close to the podcast is always sending us all these scurrilous, you know, <laughs> reports yeah. that the Mando wants to not wear his mask and he's being huffy about it. And this isn't but, uh, his COVID mask. He, meaning, uh, <laughs> meaning no, no, Pedro no, right. Pascal this is wants the to take off the helmet. Mask. And yeah. So I know two people who might be happy to shoot under these conditions for the Mandalorian for that's coming out in 2021. First, 
there is Pedro Pascal who might be, now be happy to be able to wear his Mandalorian mask when he shoots. Right, exactly. And the other one is um, who I'm starting to refer to as Cara Dunplorable, um, who <laughs> does not want, clearly <laughs> does not believe in masks. <laughs> Uh, listeners will say right at the front that we're going to refer to Cara Dune, the character. So when we say things like, oh, I kind of like this scene with her or her line, know that once again, we're talking about Cara Dune, the character. We're going to stay focused on the planet of Navarro in this podcast and not come down to earth too much for any craziness. <laughs> All right. So you don't want me to refer to her as Cara Dune plurable? Nah, not yet. No, <laughs> okay. come All right. on. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to keep that in the back of my head, though. Okay, so, Catfish, are you ready to get in and to jump into this episode we both loved? Yes, absolutely. Well, I want to get right at the top. We're talking mm-hmm. about two adorable moments. The Razor Crest, this hunk of junk, is still doing rough. And without even discussing the scene, we got to talk about the theory right at the top. <laughs> yeah. You're flying it's, through the it's, vacuum it's of space. It's completely faulty. Yes, yes, I agree. You're flying through the vacuum of space. And I understand you need some repairs and, hey, you don't want to be screwed in the vacuum of space. But do you trust an infant to go fix your spaceship while you're flying in the vacuum of space? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't because, first of all, I'm not exactly sure that... Twoda really understands what he is saying. I wouldn't trust yeah. Twoda to understand the difference between red and blue unless, as they've been going around in space, there have been long hours of scenes that we haven't seen of him showing Twoda pictures. Mm-hmm. Red, red, <laughs> blue, blue. No, I mean, obviously they've set it up so it's very small, at least the hole he's looking, the Mando's looking through, but... Yeah. You can't tell me that Mando can't figure out a way to get there. And it just seems extremely (laughs) ill-advised. Would that have made the show better if that had caused the destruction? You know, like, wait, whatever you do, the Razor Quest blows up at the end. And then it suddenly becomes the Cara Dune and Grief Cargo show. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Okay, it didn't make too much sense, but did you at least laugh and giggle at this ridiculousness of Twoda trying to fix this ship. This, to me, is the best kind of humor for this show. It's just the best. As I mentioned early, Pelimoto, and I don't blame the actor, and I don't, no. I don't, I don't know what's quite right about it, but it just doesn't, it's not working for me. But this kind of comedy, oh, it gets me right where I live. It was really good. And then it led to another, quote-unquote, cute to adorable moment. After they've realized, okay, this ship's in trouble and we're going to have to get some repairs, they go down and have a little break. They're drinking what we assume is soup. And Mando, hold on, he lifts his mask up a little bit to drink his food. And I'm thinking to myself, is this allowed? Because you saw Tuota trying to take a peek under that mask and get a look. Is that allowed by the code? Is Mando being influenced by those people he's met last week? And even the marshal that he met back in episode one of season two, that these people who wear these things and then take them off? Or, like, is the Mando releasing his rigid, I wear this mask at all times behavior? Or is this allowed? Because it's not like really anybody could see anything other than his chin. How did you read it? Well, I did take note of that. You know, last week when I was interacting with our our loyal listeners on Twitter, we were talking about how Mando goes everywhere. He's like, hey, can you help me with this? And then they snare him in something. And so I said something which I thought was funny, but just got lost. (laughs) I was trying to get the hashtag Mando needs a hando to go across the Twitterverse. And not in any (laughs) sexual manner, uh, but just that he always needs help. Right. But now I'm thinking Mando needs a straw o. <laughs> Get him a straw. How could he yeah. how could he not in all this time of eating and drinking not have an alternate way? But I also think it's ridiculous that at some point, unless the Mandalorians have tried to be celibate, that it's exceedingly strange to think about you know, and he's also he's got a shower at some point. Like I don't know. It's, well, is uh, it any it, part of your body you can't show? Like if he was naked as a minor bird, but still had his helmet on, would that be okay? I think that would be okay. I think that yeah, would be okay. Like according would be okay. to according to what we know now, is the creed of a loony subset of Mandalorians. Oh yeah, your rude Scientology jokes, which. 
cost us all those downloads in North Hollywood. <laughs> It did. It did. And now we're being, we're being investigated. I'm already getting threatening letters. There are people hanging around outside my house. It's oh, horrible. Man. That's rough. So Mando is bonded. This tribe that's based around the Mudhorn sigil, they're getting together. And Mando ships in trouble. He's going to reunite with the crew. And even though we just got this great tease last week about, hey, you want to find a Jedi? Go to this place. Ask for this person. You'll find a Jedi. Because that first bit was so humorous, and because I, as ridiculous as it sounds, I have grown to have warmth for Grief Karga in Cara Dune, I didn't mind that, hey, okay, we're not going to go there this week. We're going to fly down and meet them. And so seeing them, this sounds silly. It sounds ridiculous, but I had a big smile on my face when those two came out. Yeah, I mean, it does remind me a little bit of some fantasy books I've had trouble with. The first Law trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. That oh, people love okay. because it's dark fantasy. And in the second book, they go and do an adventure for like 150 pages. But my main problem with the first law trilogy is that like most fantasy books, people start off in very kind of rough places and then they all get together. They grow and they learn. And then in the first law trilogy, they all do that. And then the last 10 pages, they all return to the horrible people they were at the beginning of the book. (laughs) Some people love that. I thought that was fake. That was uh, cheap. Did you have trouble that we were going back to Navarro Catfish? What did you think? Yeah, I did it. I could definitely see where people would be like, we said something ourselves last week about like, I can't believe, you know, there's essentially, or maybe it was the the week before where it's like, this doesn't, this seems like an increasingly smaller universe. You know, he leaves to find something and then it's like, oh no, it's, you can find out back on this planet, which we've been to already. It, it does seem a little tough. But I didn't I didn't mind it at all, though. I did not. Now, we did have a scene with Cara Dune. Is she a marshal and she lives down there in the old armor's forge there in the covert on Navarro? Because we've seen that covert has been emptied, but there is stuff there. There is what I like to call a space prairie dog down there, which seems to be Cara Dune's. But these aliens are going through it and robbing it. These aliens are known in the Star Wars world as Aqualish. They are an alien that we've seen in the very first Star Wars film. It was in the Mos Eisley Cantina. Obi-Wan and Luke ran into a bit of trouble where there was this evil humanoid alien saying, he doesn't like you. I don't like you either. And then they try to jump Luke and Obi-Wan cuts off the arm of this Aqualish creature. And here we've got a whole bunch of them. And Cara Dune comes in and kicks axe. I thought the action scene was okay, but one bit of it that I really loved was when Cara Dune kind of rolled over this one fallen Aqualish alien and uses that body as a shield from the person shooting at her. I thought that was great. I thought that was choice. And then it seems like this lava meerkat is hers. What did you think of this action scene, Kev? Oh, I thought that it it wasn't hers because she was like, get away from me. I thought it was the kind of thing where it's like, you unintentionally save a, a creature. Then after that, that creature is going to follow you around. Just like Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is a great reintroduction to Cara D. Oh, yeah. I'm that's totally true. Yeah. No, it's a good introduction to who is she? She's a badass. And it turns out she is the marshal of the town. And Navarro, this city, I don't know if the city is also named the same thing as the planet or system. I like to joke that it was when we first saw it in season one and when it was rough and tumble and the empire was there, it was like the south side of Chicago. Now we come back to it. It's like the north side of Chicago. (laughs) Markets, people out enjoying things. It's a crazy town that now seems like a boom town that grief is running. Blink and you miss it. And there's a statue erected in the town to IG-11. The droid who helped save the town from that Imperial invasion. So awesome. You know, another thing that I was thinking as we did this is that coming back here and meeting people we know already, even though some people might think that might be a problem, is that it alleviates another problem that we're having with this. We talked about during the Frog Lady episode that it was a little rough at one point. We've got Mandalorian who's got no facial reactions. And the Frog Lady was a little bit hard to sort of get to know so the fact that we get to see actual facial reactions from people that we know and like that's a real positive to come back here and we like him by himself 
but we can't just have him by himself all the time because then we don't get that kind of stuff. Right. So that's one reason why it's good that we come back to these people. And we have teased her acting in the past, pre-Mandalorian, but I actually thought Cara Dune's smiles and quirks and teasing of Mando right here at the beginning where they're reuniting, I thought she actually did a pretty good job in that. So tip of my helmet to her. Yeah, no, I thought she did a great job. Grief was so good. It given Mando a crap about taking care of Twoda, and Grief grabs Twoda and is holding him delicately. It's super cute. Right. Now, how about this? The old cantina, which used to be filled with scum and villainy, it's become the school. We've got a protocol droid like C-3PO in there teaching people. And Catfish, have you ever been the new kid in school? The new kid who has to come into class and everybody else knows each other? Twota's put into that awkward position. Yeah, I'm never uh, n- never in the middle of a school year, but I was a military brat. So uh, at the beginning of the school year, I would say mm, three times I've been the new kid. Oh, my family. I, my family wasn't military based, but yeah, my family moved all the time. I, I don't think I ever went to a school for more than three years in a row until college. And so, yeah, I was always the new kid at the beginning of the school year. Now, mm. do you think those other kids were a bit upset that Twoda is definitely too young for this class? <laughs> the, <laughs> there's no way Twoda learned anything other than what are the local tasty treats. I mean, come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're all looking at him like, they're all looking at him talking. I'm surprised the teaching droid, Teach 4PO, was not like, settle down, children, settle down. I know. Or, okay, new student, stand up and introduce yourself. Wait, you are standing, Baby Yoda? (laughs) And how about this? We talk about Baby Yoda being the ultimate evil. Well, I'm pretty sure stealing is a gateway drug to (laughs) the ultimate evil. Those were that kid's cookies and crackers. And Twoda did not care. Is this the first time we've seen Twoda use the Force this season? And it isn't to stop a mud horn right, from killing somebody. Right, it's to steal right. somebody's Girl Scout cookies. What the hell? All right. So I want to pitch something to our listeners. All right. Let's hear it. And maybe we should do one of those polls that Matt is famous for. Oh, okay. he loves polls. Yeah. What side do you think Twoda is going to end up on? And I have three options. Okay. Uh, but I already know I want the third option, but let's hear it. Okay. So it's it's the dark side, right? The light side, yep. Or the side of beef. <laughs> I told you I knew I wanted the third side. <laughs> <laughs> this kid, I mean, this is really—you're stealing somebody's thin mints. That's not cool, Twoda. Or, or, oh, or steal man. one. You took the whole pack, dude. Come on. I know. I, listen, he is—he cannot be trusted one bit. No, there was a cute little girl in there who had Ray's haircut and or Ray's hairstyle, excuse me. And so one bit of lore for people who love lore, we know in the prequel movies and theoretically, even though we didn't see it in the original trilogy, the capital of the galaxy, the capital of the Republic was this planet that's one big city called Coruscant (coughs) to catch up, up everybody on the lore. The protocol droid teaches that the new Republic capital is currently on the planet of Chandrilia. And so that's kind of, if you really know this lore, you know that the planet, that the capital planet that blew up in The Force Awakens wasn't Coruscant. It was a different capital city. And the new canon of Star Wars lore says that after Palpatine fell in Return of the Jedi, one of the things they did is they had a rotating capital so that the capital could be shared around the galaxy. So it would be here for a bit, here for a bit. And that's why this droid said, currently on Chandrilia. So last week we had a question, what would Mando's first word be? You You mean Baby Yoda's first word. Sorry, sorry, yes, yes. Or or food. And now I think Twoda's first entire sentence will be, steal your food, I must. (laughs) No, wait, no. Over there, what is happening? (laughs) (laughs) And you turn your head and then you turn back, where's my food? Yeah, it's great, it's cute, it's hilarious, and it's also by leaving Twoda behind. Twoda got left last week with the frog people, this week he gets left with the class in the town, and so how can you have these big, exciting action scenes where you don't always have to worry about this infant child all the time? Well, you put him on the sideline for a bit. It is true, and and amazingly funny, and, and the whole thing. 
listen, you've got to, you know, there are things that don't make sense, just like in almost everything you have scripted, especially something that goes on like this. You just, yeah. they have to do certain things to continue that may not make sense. So maybe Mando thinks that it's sort of safe to cart Twoda around and show him off on every planet he goes to (laughs) because he thinks Moff Gideon is dead. But it still seems I didn't get that sense. And so, you know, maybe when they said that at the end, this makes a little bit more sense. I mean, do, do you agree with me that this is something we just have to ignore that? Mando will show off Twota and every planet he essentially arrives and he's like, I've got this incredible creature everybody wants. <laughs> um, or is that not sort of something we have to ignore because he thinks things are safe? Well, Catfish, I didn't realize until this episode that Mando assumed that Moff Gideon was dead. Of course he oh, should thank have. God. The, I thought the, it was just me. <laughs> the TIE fighter went down. Of course he should have assumed that nobody could have survived that. Now realizing that, I think so much of this show suddenly makes sense. It's like, oh, okay, that's why he treats Twota the way he does. So I've come around to stop being so rough on Mando. With you, though, why does Twota have to go with him? If he could truly trust somebody, and maybe he doesn't want to put anybody in that danger, but why doesn't he just find a good, safe place, like with Omera on that wooden planet, leave the child there, Go find the Jedi, and then, once he knows where a Jedi is, then bring the child. But no, he's got to bring him everywhere. That absolutely does make the most logical sense. Especially because he doesn't have the philosophy, never go back. His philosophy is, (laughs) keep going back. (laughs) Right, exactly. So, hey, we talk about side quests. Suddenly, we're on a side quest. It isn't just repair the ship. It's now, you know, Mando, while you're here, guess what? This planet, it's turning around. You see how it's now the north side of Chicago. But guess what? We need to get rid of this one holdout Imperial base. It's held by a skeleton crew. Skeleton crew. It's not going to be any problem whatsoever. I mean, we barely even need you, really. Right. (laughs) Right. But since you're here, right. You know, exactly. Look at the quadrant. Look at how much the quadrant's perfect, except for this one little spot on the other side of the planet. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Plus, you all know that Stormtroopers' armor is weaker. Like, it's less effective than essentially just wearing sponges all over your body. (laughs) Come on. We'll just go destroy this infrastructure that we could possibly reuse and use to help the town. We'll just blow it up. It's logic. And now, another thing that makes no sense to me, but added a lot of humor to this episode, was... Let's have Mithril drive us out here. And then the original plan was, uh, it seems to me, we're going to go inside and Mithril's going to hang outside. Yeah. In you're a, you're in the getaway a, in, car. You hang outside. And, right. And he's completely trustworthy and we're going to trust him <laughs> to stay outside and wait for right. us and not drive away and try to escape the planet. Right. Uh, not try to escape the 300 year sentence that you've stuck him <laughs> yeah, with. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Makes no sense, but I'm, I'll buy it. Now, were you happy to see Horatio Sands' blue mithril back on the show? I'll say for me, Catfish, you had a lot of trouble with that frogman uh, masks and costumes. For me, mithril himself looks more like a Star Trek alien, meaning it's absolutely it, you can see somebody's face through it. I think the mithril, I actually liked him in this season more than I did in the very first episode of season one. I liked him in this episode more. It's just interesting that we bring him back. Why we need that comic relief. If baby Twota isn't on this siege of this imperial bunker with us, we need some comic relief. So let's get this guy out of carbonite. And so I I actually, even though I'm not a fan of that type of alien, and I didn't really like him in season one so much, this episode had already put me in such a good mood. I was like, okay, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I Yeah, he's fun. He's fun. I agree with you. I, I enjoyed him more in this one last one. I, I actually liked him in the last season, too. The only strange thing is I, I know that, like, he was in last season, mm-hmm. and so people may not have remembered him that much, but they do spoil his arrival in the previously on. In the previously on, that's correct. You're like, oh, wow, I guess we're going to see him again. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I famously cannot remember things that happened last season, last week, yesterday, but I remember Mithril, so... So he's memorable, that's good. (laughs) Well, right, right, right. But it is, they kind of ruined it a little bit in the previously on. And he is getting this grief from grief. (laughs) 
I mean, it is so ridiculous. Drive him out there. Hey, you want 30 years off your sentence? I do want 30 years off my sentence. Why are you saying it so angry? You want 30 years off your sentence? Get over here and open this door. Okay, sure. So, Catfish, I'm going to give our listeners a little quiz. This is a quiz for you listeners. Uh I want you to tell me how many Imperials slash Stormtroopers died in this siege. So, remember, it's made by a skeleton crew. I did the math. I did the work and counted them all up. So, at the end of this episode, we're going to reveal how many characters died. And this is a Disney Plus show. (laughs) So, you know, our kids love it. But can you imagine how many people died? I mean, do you have a guess, Catfish? Wow, I am going to guess, uh, I am going to guess less than you think. I'm going to guess 42. <laughs> okay, listeners. Now, I will say this. I mean, yes, this was not really a skeleton crew. They thought there was a skeleton crew because apparently on the base, they're like, hey, we're trying to hide here so nobody gets to go into town and drink. They were just faking that there was a skeleton crew. Catfish, you have come very close with your guess, is all I'll say. We'll reveal the answer at the end, Lester. Yes! I'm so excited. Why don't we just go through, talk randomly about this beginning stuff. Mando jetpacks up. He throws somebody off the landing pad up at the top. They come in, and they get to the infamous place where we got to turn off this coolant so this thing will shut down. And the Mithril has the great line that we all think, that Robot Chicken thinks, that everybody thinks. He's there, grief is giving him grief, and he's got to go out over the edge. And, of course, he says the classic line, there are no guardrails on this. (laughs) (laughs) You know, another thing that I'll say is that both in the Star Wars game that came out like in the last year for PS5 and previous ones that I've played, Mm -hmm. this kind of setting, this this kind of the docking bay, this whole thing was also giving me flashbacks to those games. That was awesome too. Yeah, no, they have these type bases everywhere. The base that they go to possibly kill Galen Urso in Rogue One, it's like this. It's at the top of a big cliff and that's where ships can land easily at the top of this cliff and then enter the underground bunker. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, Catfish, it's a typical action scene. So far, it really is a side quest episode with no other ties to the larger world. And because there were good humor, because there's good action, I was actually smiling and going along. But then when they come into this room where there are these creepy looking bodies in this water, maybe back of tanks, whatever, and it looks like, oh, my God, this could be cloning. My mind went crazy. I'm trying to give the energy of like, holy smokes. When I fell in love with this episode, I saw that. Holy cow. Is that one body in the cloning facility? Is that a Snoke-esque body? This blew me away. This really told me that this episode was going to be special. And actually, as soon as I saw that, I knew we were going to see Moff Gideon. Now, we didn't see him till the very end, but that scene and this crazy reveal from Dr. Pershing, I loved it. Well, I loved it, too. I had no idea wh- who the body uh, was in there. I don't know if it was Snoke. I don't know who oh, yeah, it was. We don't know. Nobody knows. Some people are guessing Snoke because one of the bodies had a, a scar on his head and forehead like Snoke did in the sequel trilogy. But yeah, nobody knows. It's just so fascinating. It's like, oh, snap. You know, this is another thing where this was from last season. Again, these they reminded us of the client and Dr. Pershing from the first season. Yeah, from the, the previously pre- on. They were in, in the there. previously on. And this just goes to show you that they know what they're doing here. You, you know, they are setting these things up. Again, they kind of hid from us exactly what the plan was yeah. last time. We, we speculated a lot about what they were getting from Twoda and what they were trying to do. We didn't know it was blood, but we did. I mean, we did kind of speculate, yeah, they're trying to get his power to someone else. But mm-hmm. I don't know if their plan is, and we'll get to that at the end, their plan is, is to bring something back to life or take something that is living already and imbue it with the power of the food side. <laughs> yeah, it you is. You know, it's like uh, they don't let needle users donate blood because no. they're worried what could be in the blood. Right. You know, there's a, a lot of jokes throughout the years about vampires sucking the blood of people who are drunk and then the vampires are drunk. So I just yeah. wonder if, like, any blood that gets infused from Yoda, suddenly the people, all they want to do is eat. <laughs> They're they like, start, I'm not going to fight anything. Right. Moff Gideon, Gideon gets the Twoda's blood into his dark troopers. And he's like, all right, 
go attack. Wait, wait, not attack the buffet line. What are you guys doing? Stop, <laughs> stop. So, okay, Catfish, I transcribed this, that mm-hmm. Dr. Pershing's message to Moff Gideon. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you a question that I think is one of the mysteries tied to it. So Dr. Pershing says, replicated the results of the subsequent trials, which also resulted in catastrophic failure. There were promising efforts for an entire fortnight, but then, sadly, the body rejected the blood. I highly doubt we'll find a donor with a higher M count, though. I recommend that we suspend all experimentation. I fear that the volunteer will meet the same regrettable fate if we proceed with the transfusion. Unfortunately, we have exhausted our initial supply of blood. The child is small, and I was only able to harvest a limited amount without killing him. If these experiments are to continue as requested, we would again require access to the donor. I will not disappoint you again, Moff Gideon. Catfish, who is the volunteer that could meet the same regrettable fate if we proceed with the transfusion? Any guesses? There's no way we can know, but do you have any guesses who this volunteer who's been taking these transfusions could be? Well, this is what I'm going to pitch. Oh, and let's I, I want you to sit down and I want you to try to control yourself as All it right. happens. Okay. Moff Gideon, we thought he's dead. Yep. He's still alive. Oh, yeah. So that means that people that we assume are dead could be alive. So clearly the volunteer is the client. Hold on, let me take a drink of this water. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, we'll I would have love it if, if that were true. Werner this episode's Herzog. gonna. If th- that were true, Catfish, this episode's gonna go beyond ten out of ten. It's gonna be twenty <laughs> out of ten. Well, okay, so that's a joke. Even though I completely mean it, and we all want the client to be back to say parsec. At this point, do. Do we assume that's someone new or someone we've seen before? The only person that I could think of would be Moff Gideon himself, but clearly right. Dr. Pershing wouldn't say the volunteer if he was talking to Moff Gideon. I can't think of anyone, anybody bad that we've seen that's still alive. No. So I wonder if it's just somebody new and not anybody important. I think it's got to be somebody new, and I think he, that person may become important. I think, once again, this just opens up so many possibilities and gives us a reveal that we didn't know. We could only guess, and we're still having to guess about some of these things, but let's be honest. When these characters, the two Imperial scientists who were like, destroy all this evidence before Mando and his crew get it, the fact that they're wearing patches that the Camino cloners had on in Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, the fact that Dr. Pershing has that same patch, or the same symbol, I should say, that the cloners had in Attack of the Clones on the planet Kamino. The fact that we see these bodies in these water or back of tanks, whatever, that are a bit like when we saw the infant clones in Attack of the Clones. To me, they are using the high M count, aka the high midichlorian count of Twoda to either give people force powers, bring things dead back to life. Yeah, I mean, it opens so many possibilities. And to think that we're getting it now in what could possibly be a side quest, it makes this mission no longer a side quest in my mind. It makes it, oh, wow, this is a big piece of the entire story. So I just loved it. But also when you listen to it, it still is a little confusing. It feels like a contradictory statement in that he says we need more blood. We've exhausted our supply. Mm -hmm. But he says the volunteer will meet the same regrettable fate if we proceed with the transfusion. So it makes it sound like they do have a little bit of blood left or not. His statement seems contradictory. Right. We don't want to go through with the transfusion, but then he makes it seem like they couldn't do a transfusion. They don't have any more blood. Right. So is the volunteer also the body that rejected the blood, or did they do transfusion to some other body or some other volunteer? It looked okay for a fortnight, then it died. And so now this other volunteer, we don't want to give it the blood because it may die within a fortnight to it. This is just fascinating is all I'll say. We don't have the answers. Listeners, if you know the answers, if you have better ideas than we do, which isn't going to be hard, Write to us on social media at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. Is this too sci-fi for it? Do you like Star Wars more as a Western fantasy? And now we're getting into this weird sci-fi part with mystical midi-chlorians and scientific clones. Let us know at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. Leave those YouTube comments. We want to hear it. I love it. 
So Mando, seeing this message, he's like, well, Moff Gideon's dead. And the Mithril explains, no, this message is from three days ago. Mando says, if Gideon's alive, then, and this is the most perfectly timed attack from stormtroopers ever. Because he doesn't need to finish the sentence. We all know what <laughs> what it means if Moff Gideon's alive. And so, you know, I'm trying to think of when other a perfect timed attack from stormtroopers could be. It'd be like something like, Will you take this woman to be your wife? I will. You may now <laughs> kiss the, you lean in to kiss stormtroopers attack. Oh, we knew what was going to happen. They were going to kiss. I mean, this was ridiculous. I think the oh. only worst time would be like, you know, you got a day off, right? Yeah. You got a day off and you're like, what are we going to do? Oh my God. You know, it's been so long since we went to the beach. You go to the beach, you're sitting there, you get there and you're like, oh my God, it's a beautiful day, but nobody's here. You spread out your towel, you put your chairs down. <laughs> yeah. Put on some suntan lotion, and then 75 stormtroopers show up. (laughs) (laughs) Through great honey, come on, let's pack up. Pack up the speeder, let's go back home. And so we have this great escape. Catfish, we mentioned that Carl Weathers directed this. How did you feel he did on this great escape where Cara Dune, Grief, and the Blue Mithril have to jump into this Imperial tank, it seems like, and have to evade these awesome speeder bikes and TIE fighters. I thought Carl did a great job directing. I thought it was fabulous. I didn't know at first why they wanted to go inside and, like, take the stairs down with this thing. (laughs) Uh, But that got closed off. They left. Of course, there's a funny bit where the speeder is uh, is dead now. Right. It Um, was a great cushion. The racers... That bit was phenomenal. Those guys did some cool stuff. Oh, my God. Did, it's hard to think that the Mandalorian could make speeder bikes cooler than they already were. But those speeder bikes going over the waterfall, over the edge, down. Now, it was a bit comical that two stormtroopers crashed trying to go down. But they still made them, made them <coughs> seem cool. This was just great. This was very good action. And you have to tip it up to the effects team. This is, I assume, not a full motion picture budget that they're having to do all these stunts on. I I thought it was great. It was phenomenal. It was exciting. This managed to be exciting, and it had moments of humor in it. That's the best kind of thing, Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Kara taking that one out by slamming him into the side. Oh, yeah. I thought that would be the worst death of them all. That would be my worst death. (laughs) I don't know. That's It's pretty quick. It's pretty quick. (laughs) Okay. Well, what's the worst death? How about the guy up on the roof who's about to throw a grenade into it? When finally Grief spins the guns around, sees him, and right at point-blank range gets hits with those blasters. As the ship drives away, you later see his helmet tumbling over. I loved it. That was fabulous. I mean, obviously, the worst deaths are the slow deaths. Like, if the client has you tied up and he's like, I am slowly draining your blood. (laughs) That's the only way he could. He couldn't drain your blood fast. He's a slow guy. Right. Let me tell you stories from Fitzcarraldo. Listen, Actually, I would love that. That'd be great. It is too gruesome that your brother was eaten by the rancor, but I do have this audio recording of it. Here, I'll put the <laughs> headphones on so you can hear it. <laughs> okay, how silly is it? This shows how effective the show was. As ridiculous as it is for me to say this, knowing this is a Disney Plus show, these are lovable characters. For a part of me, when they're surrounded by those those TIE fighters, I thought, oh my God, are they going to kill Kara, Grief, and the Mithril? And I thought they could because they are obviously just side characters who so far really only appear in a couple episodes a season. The thing that I was not clear to me was why they thought that getting to town would make them sell. Oh yeah, safe. that's a good thought, point. Yeah, I thought, is there a, do they have some sort of laser shield they can activate like <laughs> right, yeah. getting to the t- what's the magic about getting into town like uh, they're going to be able to hide in the market i don't think so we could hide in the school they'll never shoot at us where these kids are <laughs> <laughs> yeah right 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 <laughs> yeah the code of the stormtrooper <laughs> so arriving at the last second it is mando in the razor crest And we have this awesome fun scene and it was fun for the viewers, but I honestly think baby Yoda had the most fun when he raised his hands up. That was hilarious. Oh my God. So amazing. He's doing it at a couple different times. Baby Twoda. Oh my God. You wouldn't take a baby Yoda on the more mellow rides at Disneyland. He wants to go on the exciting rides. Space mountain only, you know, big thunder Mm -hmm. mountain, Mm -hmm. splash mountain, anything with a big drop. That's also near where they serve those turkey legs, like you were saying, catfish. 
Okay, so hey, our heroes have won. Everything's good. Somehow the Razor Crest got fixed in uh, the time that this trip took. You know, it's funny. I was going to say, well, maybe they just fixed it enough, but they fixed it enough so that Mando didn't even land again. He's like, see you later. Right. I, I thought the same thing as you. My God, these guys are fast. Excellent service there. And now the episode isn't over, though. We are going to spend more times with Grief, Cara Dune, and the Mithril. And I had a question for you. So those X-Wing pilots who seem this is their patrol area in the Outer Rim, they show up. And why isn't Grief helping them? So, okay, yes, it's your town. You don't want any new authority coming in. But Grief, there could be other Imperial remnants out there. Why not tell these guys what you did to help them keep your town safe? He's a bit too close to the vest, old Grief is, in my opinion. I agree with you. I thought that was weird, too. It seems to be kind of of a piece here, right? The same thing happens with Kara, where it's like you would think they would be cool with, you know, what seems to be sort of the right side of things. Yeah. But it feels like it's the kind of thing where it's like if you're in the middle of the war of a war and you're not a participant and people are like fighting over your land or people are just fighting and you see bad things happen on both sides. I think at a certain point you just don't trust either side. Can Mando the same thing close to the vest. It's just not wanting to get wrapped up in other people's troubles. Okay. Okay. I, I think you're right on how we're supposed to take it, but still a part of me was like grief. I know. I on. absolutely agree. Yeah. Tell them we took care of business they just kicked a bunch of ass here. It's entirely likely that the ass they just kicked, which was only a very small part yep. of, you know, they would just decide, you know what, mm, as retaliation, why don't we just obliterate that entire town? Of course. Yeah. Especially the kids. Boy. <laughs> now, the pilot who comes up and talks to Cara Dune, you know, he tells her about, hey, there's bad things happening here. Not everybody in the core world believes it. We need people right. out here to support us. He's Says, the only pilot in this Parsec, by the way. Oh, good point. I mean, he's good one point. of two pilots in the Parsec. <laughs> good point. He says, says here, you're from Alderaan. I served during Alderaan. Did you lose anyone? Catfish, is that question insensitive? The freaking planet blew up. Did you lose anybody? Uh, I mean, wow. I mean, this really seems like, yeah. You, you, could, you could try to get someone on your side, but... I don't think being a dick is going to help your cause. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think what, it, you know, it's hard to come even come up with a real world analogy. Ah, oh, your your parents were on the Titanic. Did you lose anybody? I mean, well, <laughs> come on, buddy. And even that's not, per oh, that this would be it. This would be it. Okay, tell me. It says here you're from the Hindenburg. You lose anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but the problem with your analogy, and I I don't have a better analogy either, is that these are natural disasters, and what he's trying to say is, don't you want to give some payback to these people who yeah. who messed with you? No, you're right. You're right. I just yeah. still thought, that's a real odd question. Rather than, did you lose anybody, it should have been like, did any of your people survive? I mean, come on. The funny thing, too, is he wasn't like being a hard ass. No. He was like trying to be sensitive while also just rubbing salt in the wound. <laughs> right in it. There are things that I don't say because I don't want to show off my idiocy. Like, I didn't want to say, like, I didn't know that how he would know that Moff Gideon wasn't dead. I, I, right. I guess I missed that. So when you said that, I was like, okay, thank God. But what is the thing that the pilot leaves behind for Kara? I was confused as kind of the import of that. Is he, like, deputizing her? To, I don't understand what right. it is. It, it almost looks like a badge, Catfish, and that's kind of what I thought. It could be a badge, or it could be just the main symbol on it was the symbol of the Rebel Alliance, so you would assume that's the symbol of the New Republic. Maybe it's just a symbol of, hey, you used to fight for this. You used to fight for this symbol. We need you to fight for it as well. Or it could be a badge, or it could be something else. I've done a little bit of looking online, and I don't think anybody has found it from a video game or anything else. It could be maybe the equivalent of dog tags. Like, here's some rebel dog tags. She's got that exact same symbol on her cheek, right? She's got a little tattoo there of the rebel symbol on her cheek. It could be as simple as, hey, here's the same symbol, and I'm going to pull on your heartstrings. Or it could have been something more. Listeners, if you know, once again, write us and let us know. Is it possible that it was like Arya's coin? <laughs> I thought maybe I was missing something, but yeah, let's, uh, listeners, let us know what the import of that is and what he's trying to do. I don't know. Let's go to the end. Moff Gideon. 
cut to space. We see the bottom of an Imperial cruiser flying over our heads. This is apparently an Imperial cruiser that has appeared in a lot of video games. It's not supposed to be as big as a Star Destroyer, but it's still obviously a pretty big ship based on everything else we've seen. We find out that one of those great repairmen who did such a quick and perfect job fixing up the Razor Crest right. placed a tracking beacon on it. Uh-oh. The Imperial officer finds this out, reports to Moff Gideon, says, hey, we're going to know where the Razor Crest is. He's still got the child. Moff Gideon's coming. We will be ready. Then he turns and he stands in front of a room of all these things that, according to people who've done some research, are things called dark troopers. Now, the hard oh, they're not po- death troopers? They're dark troopers. They're what's known as dark troopers. And this is where we're still not going to have great answers because in I always mention that Lucas had a bunch of lore in the expanded universe mythology. Then when he sold it to Disney, Disney said that expanded universe mythology is too unwieldy. Things contradict each other. We're going to call all that legend and we're going to move forward. Well, these things, dark troopers, in the legends, they were not living. They were droids. They were robots, pretty much battle droids like we saw in the prequels a bit. But now we don't know. Is this version of a dark trooper going to be alive? And that's why they need this blood, because they're going to build super possibly force sensitive stormtroopers. Right. That's we, what I was wondering. We don't know. But the big thing is that if you turned on the audio description, so say you have trouble seeing, there's an option on movies and TV shows where you can turn on an option which will describe what's happening to you. And in the description of what's happening, these things are referred to as dark troopers. So we know that I said on one of our previous podcasts that to have a good hero, he's got to defeat a great villain. Well, now, how does a villain become great? They have a great weapon. They have great power. And I think we're seeing what's going to happen. So anytime we see a, a trooper, there's obviously a person behind it. Right. Inside. But I don't know. Are all these dark troopers taking a nap? It really feels like they were like robots that were in stasis. Right. Otherwise, it's like, we're just going to hang out here in our little pod and just listen to Moff and, and not move. Right. Are, so, they, are they dead where they need the high midichlorians to be brought back to life? I have no idea, Catfish. This is I a mean, great if, question. If they're dead, I hope it's very cold in this room because otherwise Moff is like, oh, God, it stinks in here with all these (laughs) rotting bodies. So I was confused because, again, they did seem to be in like, you know, whatever you see movies with robots, like they did all seem to be like in shutdown mode in like potentially charging ports. Oh, so I was confused because, again, even the other kinds of troopers we've seen that weren't stormtroopers were actually humans, right? Right, the clone troopers. Yeah, there's always been a living thing inside it. We've seen battle droids in the prequels. And so once again, in the Legends books, these dark troopers were droids. They weren't living things. But I would think they have to have some... This is my own supposition. They would have to have some sort of living piece, or else why would you care about midichlorians and blood? Right, well, that's if... I think you're assuming the same thing that I was assuming when I saw it, that it was these dark troopers that he wants to imbue with the power right right? was that your that so that's my assumption too but also i just wonder if this was clumsily done so it's just like a cool image and having them appear to be sentient would mess up with the image if they're like hey hey can i I borrow a cigarette so whether that or they're implying something else about these dark troopers I don't think it was they were trying to be confusing. I think they were trying to be mysterious. I want I think they want us all to be asking these questions that you're asking. Right. Okay. So I'm just saying if it turns out at the end that these were guys that were just like being very still, that would be bizarre. <laughs> Listeners, hey, we don't know the answers. We assume the answers aren't out there, but we care about your thoughts. At Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. And Catfish, are you ready to get to feedback? Oh, man, let's do it. Yes. We had a handful of feedback, which was really just they wanted to make sure they were entered into the contest. So don't worry. That seems reasonable to me. We got everybody's me. contest specifically from our good buddy at EndlessMiko3 on Twitter, who's like, is this how I enter the prize? Right? Yes. Similarly, Stephanie Culver, who's at Culverst, that's C-U-L-V-E-V-E-R-S-T on Twitter. She sent in her subscription screenshot. Catfish, who else submitted <laughs> 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 at V Moisino? 
Mo- Moisino? V. Moisino. Uh, you can tell us how to pronounce it. We're, yeah. we're sorry that we butchered it. They said, I want another Mando Funko. Am I eligible? Yeah, you're eligible. Similarly, we had a great note from Michael Carlson, who wrote, he's a proud subscriber. Hello there. I would like to proudly enter into the subscription contest. No hot air. I've tried like four other Mando, The Mandalorian podcasts. This is the one I've subscribed to. Oh, awesome. thank you so much, awesome. Michael. Now there ha- can be only one. Now we have some great feedback about this particular episode, and let's get to it right now. Our musical genius, our musical analysis guy, Double M, Matt Murdick, who's at Musical Concepts on Twitter, he graded this episode 9 out of 10 double Vs. Double Vs? Velocity vomits. Ugh. Oh, that's smarter than mine. Oh, A little too much arm swooping in front of the chess celebrations. Woo! Come on. That was too cheesy even for Star Wars. Oh, shucks. But what fun. Oh, thank you. Heck that's yeah. was what Matt thought. And at Harley, Camille said it was, quote, my favorite episode so far. Hashtag Baby Yoda. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I agree with you. 10 out of 10. One of my favorite episodes of all time in my entire uh, podcasting career. Dooley's Left Legs says this week's show is back to its best. Continue the storyline, albeit with another side quest. He gives it nine double M's. Double M's? Yeah, missing mints. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Our loyal listeners are stepping it up. They, they are. are stepping it up for the doubles. He said, Twoda is continuing to develop sociopathic psychotic tendencies. <laughs> Mint theft plus taking pleasure in the destruction of others plus enjoying vomit-inducing speeds maneuvers. Yes. Oh, boy. We love okay. following at Dooley's Left Legs on Twitter. Another now, great follow is somebody, yeah. if you love Game of Thrones... You probably already follow her on Twitter. It's at Shakes of Thrones, where she combines the words and wisdom of Shakespeare with some memes and thoughts on how they could relate to the HBO show Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. Catfish, she gave this specific episode only 6.5 triple Fs. <laughs> oh, t- wait, triple Fs? Freaky fast fix-its. Yeah, all right. It's hard so to believe fine. the Razor Crest was all good to go after a couple hours of maintenance. There's some cute moments with Twoda. Love seeing the familiar faces, but the plot felt ham-fisted to get to the information we needed at the end. Looking huh. at other reviews, darn, I was harsh on this episode. I still liked it. It's Mando, after all. It just wasn't my fave by a long shot. Episode 2 is still my favorite of this season so far. It was the most different. Ooh, I love that thought from Shakes of Thrones. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Definitely. You are definitely a outlier as far as uh, love for this episode, but we love it when people uh, disagree with us. Yeah, and question and, us and, and make and, us think and, about other things. Yeah. But also when they put us down, we like that too. <laughs> now, Nathan Sofka says, just watch chapter 12. Now that was the way to do a side quest episode. It stands alone, but ties into the overall plot. It was nice to finally see Mando come to the rescue. As the season progresses, I just don't hope we end up with a double F. Double F? Yeah, Forgotten Fett. Oh, Boba Fett, he's still out there. And call me crazy, I think we are going to see him again. Crazy. We okay. are, but I don't care about him at this point. Catfish, we had some feedback for Chapter 11 last week's episode. Do you want to get to this? Sure. Edgar Danger at Poe Trial says the soundtrack for The Mandalorian is brilliant. Very recognizable, and it truly stands out. So much respect goes to at Ludwig Gorenson. Also, to have a podcast that really delved into the music is simply amazing. You rock at Double PHQ and at Musical Concepts. Oh, yeah. I love the expansion yeah. on the Mandalorian lore. Yeah. Significant improvement to last week. Also, Mando continues to be the most gullible Mandalorian in the universe. Well, you know, that's what happens when you grow up with homeschooling and you're told the only way to live is to encase yourself behind a mask. How about this? That's the thing we need to get on a t-shirt, Catfish. Maybe maybe for next year's prizes, we'll create Parsec Passion t-shirts which say, most gullible Mandalorian in the universe. That seems to be catching on now you said that, Catfish. On last week's so episode, we got this great note from at Patman23 on Twitter, another great Twitter follow. Patman wrote, thanks for the latest Parsec Passion podcast. Before my commute, I get to listen to it. And he said, I was immediately entertained by Catfish calling me out on the podcast. <laughs> the feud between the Pat Mandalorians and the CJG Mandalorians is heating up. 
<laughs> I, I appreciated Catfish's position as someone who's not into the lore, as fit and trim, Bubba. But Catfish and I are in the same boat mostly, since I've only seen the movies. He hasn't watched those animated shows. But he has read this classic old school novel, Splinter in the Mind's Eye, and some of the Timothy Zahn books, which now are no longer canon. He said he was aware of Bo-Katan and how she wasn't a helmet-on practitioner, but that didn't stop me from pushing back on Catfish's insistence that our bando get rid of the helmet in episode two of season one, mostly because they wouldn't have bothered to make the helmet an issue in the first episode if that was true. I can't characterize or speak to the other pushback that Catfish received, but I am glad that he has support in-universe for our Mandalorian to eventually become more open to his face being open. <laughs> but until Mando is comfortable with that, helmet on. Hashtag helmet on. Straw uh, out. Right. Uh, I'm, <laughs> also, I'm ready to argue that Mando was only saved once by the Mandalorians on the ship. The second time, the Mandalorians interrupted him from killing all the Quarrens dumb enough to challenge him. Oh, that's actually a good point. <laughs> point taken, point taken. I love it. Sometimes a player character is okay with letting the non-player characters take out the trash <laughs> thank you so much pat man we love the feedback we've got even more feedback from facebook catfish laura mcmillian says just finished your chapter 11 podcast and thoroughly enjoyed it did anybody else appreciate the irony that bo katan was so desperate to find moff gideon when she had within her reach the very thing that would make him come to her baby Lo- yoda Laura, that is so brilliant, so correct. I didn't even think about it. If she knew that, wait, I'm trying to find this Moff Gideon guy. All I have to do is broadcast out to the world that I have this thing he wants and he'll come. Or maybe he'll send a bunch of these dark troopers and you, and you would be screwed. But Laura, that was a brilliant point. I hadn't thought of that at all. So, so the answer to that is nobody I know appreciated that irony. And Laura, you just value added to this podcast. Heck yeah. Tammy Reeves loved the introduction of Bo-Katan and that sly look she gave to Twoda. Notice she didn't bother to mention that other green guy, Master Yoda, who she was very aware of during the Clone Wars. Dying to see Ahsoka, though I wish it was Ashley Eckstein appearing. And then sad face. Right. Ashley Eckstein voices the character of Ahsoka in the animated series. The rumor is it's going to be Rosario Dawson playing Ahsoka. But that is just a rumor, so we will have to see next week if that rumor is correct. Our final bit of feedback is from Stephen Manzik, who wrote, mm-hmm. Love the podcast, guys, but I think you missed a serious double M. Oh, double M? Mando mission. My theory is that Mando is destined to rule the galaxy, or at oh least play a major role. Uh-huh. First, he's going to meet a Jedi, and I thought we already had the last one. Then he's going to give Ahsoka the next Yoda, possibly restarting the next Jedi generation. Then he's going to likely meet up again with Bo-Katan to do something. Maybe help retake Mandalore. Remember the line when Bo-Katan says your bravery will not be forgotten? That seems like foreshadowing a future meetup. At this rate, Mando is the most important person in the galaxy. My goodness. Steven Manzik, you have gone on such a, uh, I don't want to say it's a vision quest. You've projected so far out there. I think there's someone that could use your legal advice, and his name is uh, Judy Rulliani. <laughs> Thank you so much for that feedback. Listeners, we don't have ads. We're just going to blather on about you guys sending us feedback on social media. Twitter and Instagram, it's at double PHQ. That's the word double, the single letter P, then the letters HQ for headquarters, at double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, facebook.com slash double PHQ, YouTube comments. We love them. We also know that you love the music breakdowns by Double M, Matt Murdock. And let's get to it. You ready, Catfish? Let's get to it. Let's get to it. People love this more than they love us. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your wrist up in front of your face. And then I want you to pull back in an over-exaggerated celebration form, just like Mithro did. Because we have a graduated theme for the child. So here we go on three. One, two, three, yeah! Did y'all do the motion? This is three episodes in a row where we have seen the child in different situations, but the same kind of Lydian chords being played underneath him doing what he's doing. This time it was at the school when he wanted to try whatever those treats were. 
Now, you might say, well, it could still just be a situation theme if back in chapter 11, the child was actually thinking about eating the baby tadpole. But I I don't want to do that. I don't. So instead, we're going to say same type of theme underneath three different situations in three different episodes, which means we can eliminate the situation thing and we can just say it's a theme for the child. And I still haven't gone back to the first series to see if maybe it showed up there. This may have been a moot point trying to collect more data, trying to get a bigger sample size. But I think with a three episode sample size, we can finally say that the child has an established theme, at least for this season. So once again, I want you to put your arms up in touchdown type fashion for American football. And then I want you to just Yell, yay! So here we go. Yay! That's just like Cara Dune, right? Celebrating. Well, and Mithro, too. They both were throwing their arms up. (laughs) Over-exaggerated celebrations are always cheesy to me, but I love them also. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Today, in fact, I have a couple of double R, double M's. Really radical musical moments. See, I can do the doubles too. One of my greatest criticisms of Ludwig in the first season of The Mandalorian was that his music didn't feel like it was part of the Star Wars universe. Now, I am a John Williams snob. I will admit that. So it makes it easy for me to kind of frown on any kind of stuff because even with Clone Wars, Kevin Kiner often used a lot of John Williams's compositions. He did his own arrangements of them, but he used John Williams's compositions. But one thing I can't discredit Ludwig for is when he decides to do that, he does it really well. First, though, I want to go with an example of what he did with his own themes in this episode. And one of them is the classic very beginning of the main theme, you know, this part. Now, when I first heard that, I didn't like it much because to me, it's just kind of an inversion of the good, bad and the ugly. And I understand trying to get the Western feel and everything, and that's fine. But I just didn't like how it was just almost too similar to that. What I do like is the way that he has applied it over several episodes with different kinds of things, different rhythms, different harmonies. And in this case, we're talking about a different harmony. The interesting thing about that line is it doesn't define either major, which would be happy, or minor, which would be more serious, let's say. It doesn't have a note that can define that. The note that defines that is the third of the chord. You don't need to know those numbers, but there's usually a note within the harmony that can define whether something is major or minor. And this melodic shape does not ever hit that note. And therefore, either can be applied. You can apply that line that I just played to a minor chord to make everything more serious, like this. That sounds serious, right? Or you can make it lighter by applying it to a major chord, like this. And that's exactly what Ludwig did this time. We're used to hearing it in the minor kind of mode a lot. Because usually when that line comes up, it means that something serious is going on. But here, when Cara Dune discovered she had a little friend after she was cleaning up the town, we heard it being applied to major. And it was set up beautifully, too. You still kind of had a little pulse thing, but the major was set up before the line was played like this. And then that Mandalorian melody was played on top of that. That little figure was played on top of the major kind of sound. And he even added a chord at the end to go with the second part of the line. He made the first part of the line major and he continued to influence that major part by adding another major chord underneath the second part of the line. So it all ended up sounding like this. (music) 
And if he wanted it to sound darker, he could have easily just changed one note in all of those harmonies, and it would have been more serious. But because this is a lighter moment where that little animal is trying to get adopted, let's say, we feel happier about it. As I said before, I'm not always enthusiastic about Ludwig's stuff because I didn't feel like I was part of the Star Wars universe. And I know in the story, you can say, oh, maybe we're getting too much into the Star Wars universe or the story of A New Hope. But I absolutely loved it at the end of the episode when Cara Dune was talking to the X-Wing pilot Ludwig borrowed from the main movies proper. He borrowed something from John Williams. You may be familiar with this theme in its usual form. It's called the March of the Resistance. We heard it first time in what? A Force Awakens is the first time that we heard it. But this is the theme that I'm talking about. Kind of a mission statement, right? It, it kind of is the pump behind the resistance as they're taking on Starkiller Base. But I love how Ludwig used this in this episode. He slowed it down. He added some major harmonies to it, so it doesn't sound minor all of the time. And he used what we call contrapuntal figures. If you listen to any Bach, there's a lot of what we call polyphony, more than one melody going on at the same time, or counter melodies, contrapuntal. That's part of what Ludwig did in this. And by making it slower and more emotional and adding different harmonic chords, different types of harmony to the melody, he made it very emotional. And that's why after Kara got that Marshall's badge, it was a sweet moment and almost kind of a sad moment because they'd been talking about Alderaan. This is the way it came across as the X-Wing pilot was walking away and Kara was looking down at that New Republic badge. I was floored. The string performance of that and just the arrangement. Plus, it's John Williams' melody, which I love. This was a, a brilliant interpretation of John Williams' melody, his theme. It made the episode for me. It was fantastic. But that's all I've got for this particular episode. Back to the boys. Matt, breaking it down every week I love his insight. He he sounds so smart that uh, that's why we put it at the end. So people, we don't put it at the front and then people list us and go, who are these morons? We put it at the well, end. So, I so mean, they're like, oh, we need some intelligence at this point in the podcast. I mean, let's face it. If we're going to do comps for the Mandalorian and people on the podcast, I think you're grief. I'm the Mithril and Matt is baby Yoda. Oh, he is. <laughs> Listeners, you want to hear more of Matt's brilliant analysis? He does a bunch of great podcasts, and right now he's covering his dark materials with Holly Hunt Pants. Search The Dust Podcast wherever you get your great podcasts out there. Catfish, we didn't talk about him too much. We talked a little bit about him, but this week, just like last week, just like friggin' every week, there were a lot of adorable moments in this episode. Bring us through them. Oh my god, there was almost too many. You want to talk about fan service in the Star Wars universe? They are serving Twoda up on a platter for us. His, ador his Twodorable has gone past 10 to 11. Twoda, as you mentioned before, coughing after crossing the blue and red wire. There's kind of an explosion. I thought just Twoda sitting in the school chair was adorable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then, of course... Him eyeing the food, then stealing it, and then just eating that sucker's cookies was so good. I mentioned earlier his, we both mentioned it, the arms up in a space battle like he was at a Disney ride. Whee! Love and it. eating cookies at the same time and then spitting up. 
<laughs> well, I mean, just throwing up that blue stuff. I mean, Yuck. What a ride for Baby Yoda this year. Okay, which is your favorite, though, of the episode? Let's hear it. It's It's got to be Twona's arms up in the space battle. <laughs> Oh, my God. I mean, at first I thought he was just excited because Mando was going to kill something else. No, but then yeah. I realized it was just because of the, the fun flying. But although I won't dismiss the idea that it was because he thought he was going to see another death. Let me say, Twoda just is taking after Yoda. The first time we ever saw Yoda in universe as fans chronologically was in Empire Strikes Back in 1980. And what's one of the very first things old grumpy Yoda did is he stole food from Luke Skywalker. <laughs> so it's a species that will steal your food. I mean, I mean, you can't trust him. Right. I'm going to give my adorable moment to stealing that sucker's cookies. <laughs> Mainly because that child actor, I think, did a great job showing restraint and not punching the puppet. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> it was she's just so damn cute. Catfish, our hero is the Mandalorian. What are your Mandalicious lines of the episode? All right. Well, this is going to be tough. And this is crazy because, you know, I do judge this a little bit by the Mandalicious lines. I'm upset when there aren't any. And I was just surprised that there were so few in this one. Yeah, there were great lines, but I don't think any came from Mando. There was one sort of that came from Mando, but... It had to do with Twoda. What was that one? Well, that was the one. I, I can't remember it exactly. This is so sad because it was when they're like, you want to come on down after the fight and everything. And he's like, and he's like I got something to clean up. Here. Right, right. <laughs> and that was uh, baby Twoda uh, yeah. spitting up on himself. <laughs> right. Well, I have some great lines that weren't. Okay, got that it. were Mandalicious, but not said by the Mandalorian. The first, I thought, is a great in-world explanation for Grief's, you know, not telling the X-Wing pilot what's going on at the end. He's talking about the New Republic. He says, they should leave the Outer Rim alone. If the Empire couldn't settle the Outer Rim, what makes them think they can? That's actually a brilliant thought, I should say. Because in the original movie, Tatooine was this kind of scum and villainy. And you really didn't see the Empire there, except when they were looking for those droids in the Death Star plant. So love that line. Now, as far as Mandalicious for fun and hilarious, the Mithril, when he steps out onto the platform and says, there are no guardrails on this. Brilliant. <laughs> but then my actual favorite, the one I'm going to vote for. So they've blown up these Imperial science officers, and one of them fell over the console. And once again, grief is given grief. He's like, go over there and find out what this is. And so the Mithril's like, okay, I'll go over here. And one of these dead bodies is laying over the console, and Mithril says, pardon me, as he pushes the body to the floor. Love it. <laughs> I think, it, and I could be mistaken, that they are sort of making a little bit of fun of the Star Wars universe when he says there's no guardrail on this. Oh, How many yeah. times have we seen, starting with the original Star Wars, where somebody had to go out on what appears to be a ledge to go do something, and there's a huge drop below and no guardrail. <laughs> so it could be that they were making a little bit of fun of that. Oh, I totally think so. And so that's why that one is my favorite Mandalicious line, because I thought it was a meta Mandalicious line. Catfish, we asked earlier in the episode how many innocent Imperials had to die in this raid. They were just minding their own business. They weren't bothering anybody when Grief came in to kill them. How many died? You guessed 42. The correct answer is 39. There were... One stormtrooper was thrown off the dock. Three more were killed when Mando, when they opened the elevator and we see Mando at the top landing. The command guy was knocked out by Cara Dune. The two Imperial scientists were shot. Seven were shot there where those cloning tubs and tubes were. Four dead in a hallway. Then Mando killed two more in a hallway. Then Grief and Cara killed five in a hallway. One got shot and fell into the lava in that tunnel. Three at the top of the lava tunnel got killed by Mando. One got killed in the elevator. Two speeder bikes crash into each other and they die. A speeder bike gets shot by Grief. One gets crushed by Cara Dune into the <coughs> canyon wall. The one gets blasted off the roof by Grief. There are four TIE fighters. They all have pilots in them. They're all dead. I mean, what you're not aware of is that, even though there's not very much room, that three of those TIE fighters had trainees in there too. Oh, so no. there was actually 40, exactly 42. 
Well, and that's just in the assault. Remember, Cara Dune also beat up all those Aqualish aliens in the forge down at the beginning of the episode. So there were probably about four there. So now the total of dead is 43 in this episode. Good yes. work, Disney. Kill them all. <laughs> I mean, clearly they don't mind because when it comes to lightly regarding death, Twota is the leader of that of that pack. Catfish, we end this episode with doing a couple things named for our buddy Grief, and one is our Grief Beef, our Bounty Hunter Guild battle, where we battle out for the puck to see who's going to win. <laughs> this week, Catfish, mm-hmm. I think let's do a little predicting. We've done a great job of predicting so far, but do you want to predict into the future and the end of this season? Mm, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think by the end of this season... Moth Gideon will have Baby Yoda, and that'll be our cliffhanger headed in to Season 3. That makes sense to me. It does make sense to me, except for the fact that unless I'm missing something, it feels like because of what's happening here that Moff Gideon's plan has changed. And why do you say that? I say that because he says they put a tracker on him and he says we will be ready. Okay. Mm, okay. So... We know that however powerful the Mando is, he's just one Mando. I'm just one man. No. So if he's tracking him and they're not going to go get him right away, and, and maybe I'm extrapolating too much, maybe their real plan is like, okay, there's not enough blood for Baby Yoda to do what we want to do. Mm-hmm. So maybe if they know, and again, maybe they don't know, maybe I'm just extrapolating from what I know. Maybe if they know that Mando is trying to reunite Baby Yoda with members of his kind, that instead of just getting Baby Yoda, he wants to track Mando to Baby Yoda's kind, and then they'll have, quote-unquote, adult Mandos. Oh, that would be great. That would be because really Because otherwise, great. otherwise what, what, what does it mean we will be ready? It's, you know, you just... Just go after him with everything you've got. And so maybe I'm just extrapolating too much on that one. Although I tend to agree with you that, yes, they'll get the likelihood. I'm glad they didn't get baby Yoda back this episode. I was worried they were going to do that. But their plan is still in effect. But maybe it has changed. And they're like, we need more than just baby Yoda. All right, listeners, you've heard us. But really, the most important answer is yours. Always reach out to us. We want you to pick a winner in the guild battle, but also we'll be putting a a poll up about which side is going to be the eventual side that Twota ends up on. Please reach out to us, first of all, at Double PHQ. That's the mothership, the Death Star. Uh, (laughs) You can reach me at CJGman67. What about you, Bubba? You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F-I-T-T-E-N-T-R-I-M, at Fit and Trim on Twitter. Catfish, we are going to end this episode the way we end every episode, with our good griefs. Something that is good out there in the world. It can be in this episode. It can be Star Wars in general. It could just be the world, world in general. Catfish, what is your good grief for this week? I I can't say anything except for this entire episode is my good grief. I've enjoyed so many of these episodes. I've been down on some of the episodes. But this, to me, is the perfect Mandalorian episode. I loved it so much. My good grief this week. Anybody in the future, let this be true. (laughs) But we have had a bunch of pharmaceutical companies say they have good vaccines to fight COVID-19. And that cheers me up. They are saying this week that they have some that are 95% effective. So that is my good grief for the week. Just as if they bring back the client, I can rate this episode up. Please let these vaccines work so that in a year or two, I don't have to rate this good grief down. But that's my good (laughs) grief for the week. I want us all to get vaccinated and to be safe again as soon as possible. Heck yes. I want my holidays and vacations back. (laughs) Oh, please. My vacation's back too. Listeners, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Pasek Passion. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew. Is that, just, wait, hold on. It's pew, pew, pew. You know what that uh, exhalation of air was? No. It, when the Mithril saw Mando. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot that we didn't mention <laughs> that he let out some gas. Oh, Mithril. I'm a professional. I brought, I brought it all in. <laughs>